Uh, so now let's move on. Uh, Ian Frazier has been a member of COAA since he was 12 years old. Uh, he was actually one of our youngest members. Uh, he recently, I believe last month, won the Young Organists, uh, Theater Organists Award, came in first place uh, playing music live to uh, silent films. And I think that's an incredible feat. Congratulations, Ian. And uh, last weekend, I had the privilege of working with him uh, at the 40th birthday or anniversary of the Coney Island Museum. I was doing magic and uh, I had a crank organ and Ian was playing live to the silent movies. Uh, and he gave a, a history of, uh, of the organs used to be played with the silent movies. And I thought it was fascinating. So I asked him if he would join us and he said, absolutely. So without further ado, here is Ian to fill in some information that you've always wanted to know. Thanks, Bob. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. And um, this is uh, my presentation on uh, silent movies and theater organs uh, that accompanied them. Um, just to give a little bit of a background, uh, I actually got started uh, when I was two years old uh, in mechanical musical instruments uh, because I heard a band organ on a carousel uh, in Staten Island, New York, where I grew up. And um, when I was 16, um, our local Amica chapter, the Lady Liberty chapter, um, we visited Chaminade High School in Mineola, New York, where there was a theater organ uh, that had been taken out of a theater in Flushing and installed in their high school auditorium. And that was sort of uh, the thing that got me interested in playing um, the organ. Uh, so I'm still interested in mechanical music and sort of have a collection going of my own, but um, sort of the thing that I do um, as I travel around and, and play all these theater organs around the country. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to move on to the next slide and we're going to be playing a uh, song because uh, every program should have an opening number. Okay, yes, yeah, so um, that uh, organ that I was just playing um, is in my living room, and that is an Allen uh, Q311 SP uh, digital theater organ, uh, which was made in 2007 um, by the Allen Organ Company of McCungie, Pennsylvania. And so there's two companies uh, that are still making um, digital 
theater organs uh, in 2023, and that's Allen and Walker, who were both in Pennsylvania. Um, now, the story actually starts with mechanical music um, because um, the theater organ starts with the Wurlitzer Company. Um, and if you haven't seen any theater organs before, you might recognize that Radio City Music Hall has um, the largest theater organ, largest original theater organ ever built by Wurlitzer, um, as well as the Chicago Theater uh, and the Blackpool Tower Ballroom are just some examples of world famous iconic um, instruments that were produced. Um, but we're actually gonna go all the way back to 1892 uh, with a man named Eugene de Kleist, who was brought over from London to North Tonawanda by Alan Herschel to build band organs for his carousels, or at the time, barrel organs. And in 1908, uh, the Wurlitzer Company, um, and we're gonna go to the next slide, um, Wurlitzer um, was in Cincinnati and they were selling de Kleist instruments under private label. And in 1908, they bought out de Kleist's company uh, when he became the mayor of North Tonawanda, New York. And uh, they started manufacturing instruments um, on the same property that his factory was on um, in North Tonawanda. And those included, of course, uh, band organs, uh, orchestrians, and all the instruments that we know and love from Wurlitzer. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, because I did this presentation in Coney Island, I had to feature a local uh, Wurlitzer band organ at the Prospect Park Carousel um, in Brooklyn. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, I'm just sort of going to explain what is a theater organ um, and how it sort of came to be. Uh, well, it was it's different from a church organ uh, because it was designed for one musician to replace uh, an orchestra, primarily for the purpose of accompanying silent movies, as well as performing popular music of that time period, which was mainly orchestral for the first, um, you know, pretty much all music was orchestral until we get to the, um, you know, the 40s and 50s and rock and roll and all the other types of instruments uh, that we start using. But uh, these orchestral qualities enable it to play popular music of any era, um, and it can play modern music as well, the theater organ, believe it or not. Um, and it really was the first synthesizer, uh, the first acoustic synthesizer, um, because it takes all of these instruments and brings it under the control of one musician. Um, now, just about every movie theater and movie studio uh, were equipped with a theater organ during the heyday of the silent movie era. And the theater organ uh, declined in 1929, uh, specifically in the United States after talking pictures came in, uh, but they found continued use playing intermission music uh, for theaters, as well as soundtracks for radio shows um, throughout the 30s. Um, so pretty much most instruments in the US were kind of thrown out <laughs> at uh, 1929, um, but radio studios were still buying them into the 30s. Um, the theater organ saw a renaissance uh, post-World War II as a concert instrument. Um, with a large group of organists and enthusiasts uh, that continues to this day um, in such organizations such as the American Theater Organ Society. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is sort of the developmental history of the theater organ. Um, it, it all starts with a man by the name of Robert Hope Jones. And Robert Hope Jones uh, was in England at the time, and he was a telephone systems engineer or electrical engineer. And he had taken a church organ uh, and electrified it um, and created one of the first um, electric relay powered um, instruments because prior to that, um, all church organs or most pipe organs were tracker organs. Uh, that means that each key had a mechanical linkage all the way up to where the pipes were and that opened a valve and allowed the pipe to speak. Well, that was very limiting because the console had to be right underneath the pipes um, and you were very limited in how you constructed these instruments and how you played these instruments. Um, and so in 1903, uh, Robert Hope Jones came over to the United States to Elmira, New York, and he started an organ factory with the financial backing of none other than Mark Twain, AKA Samuel Clemens. Um, in fact, uh, the Clemens family and the Langdon family, his wife, Olivia Langdon, uh, they were very much involved in the uh, early days of the Hope Jones Organ Company. Um, in fact, I believe his nephew um, and several other was the uh, treasurer of the company as well. Um, while there, he developed groundbreaking concepts that forever changed the pipe organ, such as the stop tab, which are those tongue-shaped uh, tabs that are all around the organ. Um, he also invented uh, many new types of orchestral uh, ranks of pipes for these instruments. Um, and he also developed the electro-pneumatic action that allowed the console to be placed anywhere in a building. So because now all of the keys and tabs are wired with electricity, you can move 
anything anywhere in the building, making it really flexible. Um, in 1908, he installed the famous organ that's still playing to this day in the Great Auditorium in Ocean Grove, New Jersey, uh, which is one of the largest instruments of its kind in the world. In 1910, um, all of these technological developments culminated in this orchestral pipe organ, uh, which he called the unit orchestra, which was the first technical term for the theater organ. Uh, theater owners, um, actually I'm skipping ahead here, in 1910, he sold his company to Wurlitzer uh, just two years after they came to North Tonawanda to start building um, band organs and other mechanical musical instruments. And um, he stayed with the company until 1914. He unfortunately um, took his own life after several, um, I guess, bad financial deals with the Wurlitzer company. But um, during that time, he was very influential in advancing um, the theater organ into what it is today. So, while this is all happening around 1910, the movie industry is growing. Um, and it's just the first purpose-built theaters start appearing all over the country uh, to screen movies. And theater owners realized that they could save money by hiring one organist instead of a whole orchestra to provide soundtrack accompaniment for the films. And so, uh, believe it or not, the first theater organs were actually not sold to theaters. They were sold uh, to hotels and lounges and cafes, um, mainly in the Buffalo area. There were some early installations. and. Um, those, uh, you know, the, the original intent of Robert Hope Jones was to create um, an organ that could replace an orchestra. And um, there was actually a musician strike in 1912, um, which Barney Wurlitzer credited um, as being sort of the event that, that sort of put them on the radar uh, with um, selling many theater organs to these theaters. In um, 1910 to 1939, uh, Wurlitzer became the largest manufacturer of theater organs, installing instruments and venues such as the Chicago Theater and Radio City Music Hall. Uh, there were other companies as well that started entering the market to compete, such as Kildren, Moeller, Morton Page, Barton, etc., and overseas in Europe and the UK as well, with brands such as Compton, Christie, and Standart, and Welty, and so on. Uh, so we're going to go to the next tab, uh, sorry, the next slide. Uh, this is a diagram from a 1929, I believe, issue of Popular Science. Um, showing a really um, cool diagram of a theater organ installed in a theater. And you can see on the right-hand center, just uh, the console's sort of the only thing you end up seeing in the theater, but behind the walls are all of these complex pneumatic and electro-pneumatic devices, um, along with all of the ranks of pipes, as well as percussion instruments from the orchestra as well. And there were also sound effects, uh, car horns, train whistles, doorbells, et cetera, uh, to match up with the action on the screen. So I'm going to go to the next tab, uh, next slide. I keep calling it a tab, sorry. <laughs> this is a picture of an organ chamber um, of a Wurlitzer Theater organ. Uh, this is actually an organ that was in the Rainbow Room at Rockefeller Center. Um, I just took this picture a few days ago uh, because this instrument's just a few miles from my house in Rahway, New Jersey. And um, you can see how all of the ranks of pipes are laid out on chests. Uh, there are also regulators that sit underneath the pipe work um, that regulate the air pressure. Uh, there are also devices called tremulants, which shake the air um, to produce a vibrato effect, sorry. Um, and so this is sort of a, a, a picture of a theater organ in action. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, this is a picture of my Allen organ here at home. Um, and sort of just to give you a little bit of a um, layout, because you're going to be seeing how I'm utilizing these tabs and keys as I'm playing. Um, the organ is laid out from bottom to top. There's the pedal board. Then there is a keyboard on the bottom and we call the keyboards manuals um, on pipe organs. And the bottom keyboard is called the accompaniment manual. The middle is called the grate and the top is called the solo. And in some cases, when we have a four manual instrument, uh, the fourth manual would be called the bombard or orchestral manual. Um, the stop tabs are laid out um, in a horseshoe layout, uh, which was an innovation of Robert Pope Jones, allowing the tabs to be an equal distance from the hands of the organist, allowing for uh, the best ergonomics. Um, and of course, from left to right, they're split into divisions. So on the left is the pedal stops for the pedal board, accompaniment, great, and then solo all the way on the right. Um, now, this is not reflective of how the organ is laid out in chambers, because uh, classical organs, you might have a swell chamber, as they would call it, uh, which would be a room full of pipes uh, for the swell manual. 
and then you'd have a choir manual and a choir chamber and so on. Uh, well, theater organs are unified, which means that there are only two chambers, or in some cases four, they mirror each other in stereo, left and right. And um, the divisions on the console, which is where we play the organ, are not reflective of what is happening in the chambers. Um, and so that means if I play a flute on one keyboard and then I put it on the other keyboard, it is the same flute pipe. Um, there is no, uh, I guess, redundancies. There's no multiple, there's no swell flute and choir flute. There's just one flute. Um, or you may have more if you want more tonal variety. Uh, so that's sort of the, the mentality of how these organs were laid out for maximum ergonomics and orchestral playing. And of course, not every stop is everywhere, even though that is technically possible with electro-pneumatic relays. Um, they really just put wherever anything is most practical. So every stop is pretty much represented in the middle keyboard, because that is what we play typically with our right hand. And then, of course, the most useful stops for the pedals, the bottom keyboard and the top keyboard are assigned as needed um, when the organ was designed. Um, in fact, I'm going to, while we stay on this slide, I'm, you're going to hear some sound actually um, while looking at this slide, just to show you sort of the orchestral nature of these organs, because you're going to be hearing all of these sounds put together. Uh, but I figured why not uh, show you the sounds individually. So we actually have a clarinet pipe, which is designed to sound like a real clarinet. That is the clarinet. We also have strings. Those are the strings in the organ. Um, we also have a diapason, which is a church organ rank. And that is the foundation of pretty much all pipe organs is the diapason. Now the theater organ has a special rank that was invented by Robert Hope Jones called the tibia clausa. And what the tibia clausa is, is essentially a big flute that is very uh, mellow sounding. And it sounds like a circus calliope almost when played on its own. Now, if we take a device called a tremulant and turn that on, that takes the air and dumps it at a frequency. And what that does is creates a vibrato effect. And when you play the tibia with a vibrato, that is the classic theater organ sound. And one organist described the tibia as sort of being the glue that holds all of the stops together. Because I can play a tuba, for example, on its own. And it will sound sort of like this with a tremulant. And sounds nice, it can be useful for certain applications, but if we add the tibia, it gets very much richer. And so that's sort of a guide to the various tonal families of the theater organ, which are based on uh, the sounds of the orchestra. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, now, since I did this program last week in Coney Island, um, I figured I'd highlight some of the theater organs that were in Coney Island at the time. Uh, there was the RKO Tilyu Theater, um, which had, if we go to the next slide, a Wurlitzer theater organ installed in it. And that instrument actually still exists. And um, just by sheer coincidence at the uh, convention that I was at last month, I almost crossed paths with the owner, but, but ended up not completely crossing paths. So it turns out this instrument still exists and is in a private collection. Um, and on the next slide, there was a, there actually still is a theater organ in Coney Island in the Shore Theater, which is currently abandoned, unfortunately, awaiting conversion potentially to a hotel. Uh, but the chambers are still intact and there are components of what was a molar uh, theater organ, a 20 rank molar, um, still in the theater, right across the street from Nathan's and the train station. So now we're going to go to the next slide. And we're going to start with our first uh, set of songs and the first movie. Uh, so this is Mabel Normand. And uh, I apologize, one second, I'm just uh, learning something up to see, oh yes, apologies. So anyways, Mabel Normand uh, was an actress, she was a screenwriter, she was a director, producer, and comedian. Um, and she was actually born in Staten Island, New York uh, in the 1890s. And um, if we can advance to the next slide. 
Uh, she grew up in this house, which was right across the street uh, from Sailor's Snug Harbor on Staten Island. Um, and if we go to the next slide, her father was a um, woodworker, a technician in the Snug Harbor um, Music Hall Theater, which is still standing uh, and they put on plays in the theater now. If we go to the next slide, Um, in 1912, she was discovered by Max Sennett, who was the founder of Keystone Studios, and brought her to California, where she started making movies uh, with people like Charlie Chaplin and Fatty Arbuckle and so on. And she became a really big star during the 19-teens. Um, and after making it big, um, about 1917, she bought her parents and family uh, this house, which is actually just blocks away from the St. George Theater on Staten Island, which is where I play the organ uh, for pre-shows about once a month uh, during half the year. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, around that time, she starred in a blockbuster movie called Mickey, and, uh, which was produced by Max Sennett. And then we're going to go to the next slide. This movie was a massive hit um, in that year. And here's a poster that I have uh, in my own collection uh, from this movie, uh, from a um, sort of hall that was converted into a movie theater in um, New Hampshire, I believe. So we're going to go to the next slide. Neil Murray, um, with lyrics by Harry Williams, uh, wrote this song um, dedicated to Mabel Norman uh, after the success of the film Mickey. And it's of course called Mickey. And so we're gonna go to the next slide. And here is a video of the song Mickey from the film of the same title. So that was uh, Mickey from the movie of the same uh, name. Now 
we are up to the first movie of the evening. Uh, this is a short silent comedy film it's from 1912, the very first year uh, that uh, Max Sennett and Mabel Norman started working together. And it's called At Coney Island. And it was filmed uh, in Coney Island, of course, in Luna Park. And um, this film uh, is actually incomplete. It's not the complete film. Uh, it's a little bit hard to follow along, but there are subtitles. Uh, but the only version in existence was the Dutch version. Uh, so I took the Dutch version and I took the subtitles and I put overlaid captions uh, in English uh, so that they're in English so you can understand what's happening in this film. Um, so this is the first film and you can see sort of uh, with these two films uh, today, the, um, the development of cinematography and of the acting uh, in the films uh, because there's quite a, a difference between 1912 and 1920, which is their second film, uh, the quality of the acting um, and the storytelling and the, um, the filming techniques. Uh, so without further ado, here is At Coney Island. Thank you. 
So that was uh, at Coney Island. Um, and I forgot to mention at the beginning that most of the scores um, or the two scores that I'm doing are pretty much improvised. And sort of the, the technique that we use to accompany these silent films is we sort of, we get to know the movie. Uh, so we know what's coming next in each scene. Um, and we sort of find, you know, whether we can improvise or compose themes uh, for each character and scene on our own. Um, and sometimes we find opportunities to find, to integrate, uh, you know, existing compositions that audiences might recognize. And then uh, pretty much each time we do it, it's, it's different every time because we're always um, improvising and figuring out uh, what to include and, and what goes with what. Uh, so um, I should also mention uh, that uh, Mabel Normand and uh, Max Sennett were the subject of a musical uh, by Jerry Herman, who um, wrote Hello Dolly and uh, it starred uh, Robert Preston and Bernadette Peters, and it was called Mac and Mabel. And uh, so I'm going to be playing now um, a song from Mac and Mabel called Time Heals Everything. Now, there were two uh, things also that I'd like to mention uh, before we move on that I forgot to mention earlier, which is that the opening song uh, was called Shuffle Off to Buffalo from 42nd Street, written by Harry Warren, which I forgot to mention after I played that. Um, and then also in the history section, I forgot to mention that actually the theater organ uh, is, is really the last um, and final iteration or innovation on the pipe organ after centuries of development. Because from the theater organ onward, we got the Hammond organ and all of the electric analog organs uh, leading us to the digital computer technology that we have today. Um, and so only minor improvements like new digital uh, relays and stuff have been invented for the pipe organ. But the, you know, I, I would say the theater organ is probably the last true redesign of the pipe organ uh, throughout its history. 
Um, now we're up to the second film of the evening, uh, which is Number Please, uh, starring Harold Lloyd um, and Mil Mildred Davis and Roy Brooks. Um, and this film was filmed in um, the Long Beach Pike uh, on the other side of the country from Coney Island. And uh, Long Beach Pike was filled uh, with amusements. It was a very large amusement district. And um, many uh, bygone attractions uh, will be featured in this movie. In fact, Bill Nunn's uh, Ruth and Stone Model 38 was mentioned earlier. Uh, and the facade that he has, uh, that he's going to be putting on that organ uh, came from the Long Beach Pike, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that um, facade can be seen in this movie, the silhouette at least of it in the background because the loof carousel at the Long Beach Pike is featured prominently in uh, one of the scenes in this film. And in the background, in another scene, you can see the Cryer and Church Derby racers um, along with the coaster and a lot of uh, really great shots of the rides in Long Beach. Um, uh, and of course, Harold Lloyd is one of my favorite um, silent movie comedians. And, um, and of course, since this is um, eight years after At Coney Island, you can really see the development of film technique and acting technique. So without further ado, here is Number Please.
Go. Thank you.
And that was uh, Number Please. And I should also mention that uh, Mildred Davis um, was Harold Lloyd's wife uh, in real life. Um, and Roy Brooks also uh, was a very good friend and coworker of Harold Lloyd. Um, so now we're up to uh, the last song in the program. And there's a bit of a backstory behind it um, because uh, actually I actually apologize in the background, the uh, thunderstorm sort of have arrived here in New Jersey. And so there might be a bit of uh, thunder in the back background, but um, uh, this um, is a portrait of Charles Feltman, who in 1867 had a push cart on the Coney Island boardwalk um, is widely believed to be the inventor of the hot dog. And um, he built a large restaurant in Coney Island, um, which we're gonna go to the next slide. And here is a picture of the, or a postcard of his restaurant and beer garden. And um, right on the left where that uh, moxie stand is, is where the cyclone roller coaster is today. And on the right is the current modern day um, Luna Park, which is not, has nothing, no connection to the original Luna Park that was on the other side of the street. Um, and at Feltman's, uh, two rides uh, were constructed on the property. And we're gonna go to the next slide. And this is all on Coney Island, uh, but these two rides were built by William F. Mangles, who was the inventor of the whip and the first in the United States to patent the overhead jumping mechanism for the carousel. Um, next slide. Here is a picture of the carousel that he built for Charles Feltman um, at his restaurant. And it was a four row, um, reusing some loof figures from an earlier machine that ran there, um, along with brand new spectacular Illions figures. And this was known as the Superba or otherwise known as the Fabulous Feltman. Uh, there were four band organs on it and um, really spectacular carousel. And uh, next slide. And figures from it can still be ridden today because a third of the figures from the Feltman's carousel are still on the Corona Park carousel uh, in Queens, uh, New York. And um, unfortunately needs a lot of uh, restoration. Hopefully the uh, city of New York and the operators involved are restored eventually, hopefully, uh, in the future. But uh, we're going to go to the next slide. Uh, you can see just for fun, uh, the horses are all the way out in their slots. Uh, that's because not only uh, did Mangles patent the jumper mechanism, uh, which was uh, widely used at the time on British galloper carousels, but um, another system that he uh, added to the American carousel was the slotted platform, which the British were also using, which centrifugal force allows the horses to slide out um, and tilt the rider uh, to keep them from falling off at high speeds. And um, next slide. Uh, the second ride that William F. Mangles built for Feltman uh, was the Ziz Mile a Minute, which was a, a wooden electric uh, roller coaster uh, that ran um, all the way to the boardwalk and back. And um, this coaster also had a third rail system, uh, which was interesting. Um, I'm not entirely sure how that would, would have worked, but I would imagine instead of having a chain lift that we know of, uh, it would have used a third rail and traction motors um, on this coaster. Um, it actually ran for a decent amount of time. I think it was still running in the 50s, if I'm not entirely mistaken. I think I saw some footage of it from that time period. Um, next slide. Now, his son, Alfred Feltman, who took over the business around that time as well, um, Alfred Feltman composed a song uh, to commemorate the construction of the rides at Feltman's, including the Ziz Coaster. Um, in fact, the um, Coney Island Museum, uh, where I just played last week, uh, they just celebrated their 40th anniversary. And the uh, curator of the museum is Lisa Mangles Schaefer, and she is the great granddaughter of William F. Mangles. Um, and she uh, is occasionally on these uh, Zoom series as well. And uh, they have at the museum a copy of the sheet music uh, hanging up on the wall. Um, and I have my own copy as well in my own collection. Uh, so E.T. Paul published this sheet music and arranged it. And um, so, so I was very honored to uh, perform it in Coney Island at the museum. And of course, a very fun and adventurous week hauling a Hammond organ on a U-Haul truck into the middle of Coney Island, which is very fun. Uh, so here is the final song, um, Alfred Feltman's Ziz. Thank you. 
And uh, to conclude, just a little bit of uh, self-promotion. <laughs> I may be coming to your neighborhood sometime soon because uh, I'm sort of going on tour. On September 9th, I'm going to be at Cleveland at the Graves Armory Museum, uh, playing on their World's for Theater Organ. And on the 16th, I'm going to be at Dickinson High School on the uh, famous uh, 66 Frank Kimball organ. Um, then on November 13th, I'll be in York, Pennsylvania. And then finally, on March 24th, I'll be in Rochester at the uh, Eastman Bunch uh, concert as the guest artist. Um, and you can find me on the next slide on, um, on my Facebook page, which is uh, Ian Fraser Organist, where you can find out all of uh, where I'm going to be next uh, playing the theater organ. And so that brings us to the conclusion of today's program. Uh, thanks to Bob and, and everybody and Marie uh, for, um, for hosting and um, it's been really fun. Thank you, Ian, for an incredible presentation. Uh, I'd like to make a couple